you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this week we get back into our study in the book of Revelation. And uh, if you're new, understand that before Easter, we were going through the last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation. And if you want to get caught up, uh, if you haven't been with us this whole time, there's a tape series out front, just two tapes that where I go through the whole book of Revelation in like an hour's time. And so you can kind of get that and get an understanding of the flow of the whole book. But this week we, we return to, to our study in Revelation, and we're going to continue to go through this book. But it's interesting because uh, I have had several people say to me that they have friends here at the church that have told them that they're not coming back until I'm done with the book of Revelation. They go, I hate that book, you know, it gives me the creeps. And I, So tell me when he's done and I'll start going to Cornerstone again. And it's interesting. I mean, I know where they're coming from. I mean, it's one of those books where some of the stuff is difficult to hear. At the same time, God says in Revelation 22, verse 10, he says, don't seal up the words of this prophecy. You know, make sure you understand. God wants us to know what's going to happen in the end time, even if it makes us feel uncomfortable. I mean, I, I believe that's part of the point of it, is that we're so uncomfortable with it that rather than ignoring it, we go out and we warn other people about what's to come. I mean, that's the point of the book of Revelation, is knowing that Jesus Christ could return any day, it should motivate us to go out and tell people that that's going to happen and warn people. I mean, think about it. Let's say, let's say you knew, you had some inside information, and you knew that there was going to be a massive, massive earthquake here in Simi Valley. And it was going to take place sometime in the next year, maybe the next two years. What would you do with that type of information? Would you just pack up your family and move, and just, you know, forget about everyone else, we're out of there. Or, I don't, I don't believe so, I think you would warn the people that you love. You would tell your, your other family members that live in here, you know what, God, something huge is happening, an earthquake's going to take place sometime in the next couple of years. You'd probably start warning people that you're not even close to, but just acquaintances. I mean, you'd probably even go to total strangers around your block and say, look, this is going to happen sometime in the next couple of years. So, you know, here's some shelters you can go to. Here's some things you can do to prepare. I mean, don't you think you would warn people? And the question is, is if you really believed that Jesus Christ could return any day, and you really believe that in your heart, that this book of Revelation could take place any time, even in the next few years, even this week, don't you think we would warn people? You know, one of my, uh, one of my favorite people on this earth is, uh, is Bill Lucas, our junior high pastor. You guys know Bill? Bill Bill's just the coolest guy. And uh, yeah, if you don't know him, you, you probably see him walking around, shaved head, redneck. He, um, <laughs> that's what we call him. He is. I mean, he, he cooks food on the engine of his car. I mean, literally. And uh, he proposed his wife at Hometown Buffet. You know, it's, but that's Bill. It's Bill. You know, he's our resident redneck, and we love him. And, uh, but uh, this guy, he, the thing I love about Bill is uh, he will take every opportunity he gets to tell someone about Jesus. It doesn't matter what, where, whenever. I mean, I mean, this Wednesday, he comes into the office, and he was so excited. He goes, yeah, Francis, I was driving down Royal Avenue. I made a left on a sycamore, and I see this car on fire. You know, and, and the engine's on fire. And he goes, I'm over by that firehouse cafe there. So I go, I, I, I flip a Yui, you know, and I, I run into the 7-Eleven, and I grab two two liters of 7-Up. And I go running out the door with him going, I'll pay for these. Don't worry, you know. And he's running out, shaking these two-liter bottles of 7-Up and going to this car. And he's, un, you know, undoing the 7-Up and spraying this car engine with these two two-liters of 7-Up. And he puts out this fire. And the guy who owns the car is like, uh, thanks, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so he helps him push it off to the side of the road and then um, goes, you need a ride somewhere. And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, I could use a ride to the west end of town. So he gets into Bill's truck and the guy looks at Bill and goes, uh, you smoke pot? <laughs> and, uh, and Bill goes, well, yeah, I used to, you know. But, uh, you know, then he just started to share about his whole life and going, you know, I, I used to smoke that stuff, but, you know, then uh, I... You know, I went to this church, and he starts sharing about his relationship with God, shares his whole testimony with this guy, tells him about how he can come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, uh, and he comes back in the office going, man, you know, God gave me that perfect opportunity. You know, I love it when he just throws people my way. And, and, and that's, you know, when you hang around a guy like Bill, you just get convicted. 
because, you know, he just takes every single opportunity he can to tell people about Jesus. And I, I really think if we are studying this book of Revelation and really taking it to heart, I really believe that that's the attitude that we'll begin to have. Um, and that's the point of this book. And I, I want to kind of bring us up to date since we're at Revelation chapter 10. Some of you haven't been with us through the whole series. So in the next five minutes, I'm going to just kind of recap chapters 1 to 9 for you. Okay, just try to follow me. Chapter 1, you see John, John who was a disciple of Jesus. Remember Jesus, 12 disciples, this is John, some people call him St. John. And John, um, John is uh, on an island called Patmos. He is exiled there because it is illegal at that point to preach the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so many of the Christians have already been martyred. In fact, maybe possibly all the other disciples have been martyred by this period. And John is sitting exiled on this island, worshiping God, and suddenly he gets a vision. I believe he's actually even taken into the presence of God. And he sees Jesus. Now, this is not Jesus like John is used to. He sees Jesus now in his glorified form, after he's already ascended into heaven, and, and now he doesn't look like a human being. He's not like you and I anymore. He's in his glorified state. And John sees him. He says his face was like the sun. His eyes were like fire. His feet were like burnished bronze. He goes, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. John was so freaked out, he basically passes out in front of Jesus. Jesus picks him up and says, look, don't be afraid. It's me, Jesus. Just write down everything I'm about to tell you and write down everything you're about to see. And so that's what the book of Revelation is, is John writing down everything he hears and sees. Now, in, in chapters 2 and 3, what that is, is Jesus is talking to John and saying, write down, because I have seven churches that I need to get letters to, seven messages to these seven churches. And so John is basically uh, just writing down what Jesus Christ is dictating, these letters to these seven churches that were in existence at that time, somewhere around 90 A.D., somewhere in that area. Anyways, after chapters 2 and 3, you get to chapter 4, and that's where the scene kind of changes. John then hears a voice from heaven say, come up here. And John in chapter 4 gets to go to heaven. He gets to see what heaven is like. Probably something any of us would just give a fortune to see. Could you imagine, you know, with your own eyes seeing heaven? And he sees the throne of God. He says he sees one on the throne that has the appearance of like diamonds and rubies. And he says there's thunder and lightning coming from the throne. Around the throne are these four living beings who have, each have six wings and eyes all over their bodies. And they're screaming out how holy God is, the one on the throne. He talks about these other heavenly beings, the 24 elders in their thrones around the, the, the throne of God. And they're laying down their crowns before God. All this worship is taking place in heaven. Then in chapter 5, it continues that same scene, and he says, in the right hand of God, he sees a scroll, and it's all sealed up. It's sealed up with seven seals. These are these wax seals that they would put in, in, um, to, to basically keep people from opening the document. They had to have authority to open it. This, this scroll is in the right hand of the Father, and Jesus comes... And he takes the scroll from the Father's hand. Now, this scroll represents, it's like a title deed to the earth. It represents God reclaiming the earth for himself. And Jesus takes this, this scroll from God, and it says all the heavenly hosts are worshiping. Now it says there's a hundred million angels worshiping God the Father and God the Son. And in chapter 6, what happens is Jesus begins to take off the seals to the scroll. And John is watching this. Now, every time Jesus takes a seal off of the scroll, John gets to see a vision. It's a vision of something that's going to happen in the end times because that's what the scroll represents. So in chapter 6, when Jesus peels off the first seal, John says he sees this white horse with its rider. With a, that was holding a bow, a, 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 the rider who was bent on conquest. And it was a whole picture of this, this ruler that was going to come on this earth and somehow bring peace to the earth. And then after that, he sees Jesus break the second seal, and then he sees a red horse come. The red horse represents war. So after the time of peace, there's going to come a time of war. 
Then Jesus breaks the third seal, and then he sees a black horse coming. The black horse has a rider that's holding a pair of scales. And he's saying, um, a quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. Basically showing that you're going to have to work a full day just to get a little bit of grain for your family. Showing there's going to be famine conditions. There's going to be peace, and there's going to come war, and there's going to come famine. And then Jesus breaks the fourth seal, and he sees this pale green horse come, whose name is Death. And, uh, and it's representing how a fourth of the inhabitants of the earth are going to die during this period of war and famine and death and plagues that take place upon the earth. Then Jesus breaks off the fifth seal. When he breaks off the fifth seal, John sees the souls of those who have been martyred for their faith. Okay, so evidently, during this end time period, it is going to be illegal to believe in Jesus Christ. And during the reign of the Antichrist, those who are on the earth who believe in Jesus still will be martyred. A lot of them will be martyred. And John sees this when the fifth seal is broken up, and these martyrs are screaming out, How long? How long, sovereign God, uh, holy and true, until you avenge our blood? They say, they're, they're in essence saying, God, when are you going to punish these people for what they did to us? And then Jesus breaks off the sixth seal. When he breaks off the sixth seal, there's a huge earthquake, you know, and, and, and uh, the rulers of the earth, the sun and the moon and the stars are, 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 are going haywire. The rulers of the earth are screaming, gosh, I wish these rocks would hide me from the wrath of God. They're hoping to die. And then before Jesus opens the seventh seal in chapter 7, it, there's kind of a break in the action. Okay, so Jesus breaks off the six seals, and then there's kind of like a parenthesis where in chapter 7, God kind of goes back and fills in some of the details. And chapter 7 is when those 144,000 people are sealed. Okay, it's explained that during this time of, of, uh, of wrath, God protects 144,000 people on this earth. He seals them with a seal on their forehead, so none of this will harm them. Now, these 144,000 people are Jewish people. They are Jewish believers because it describes that there are 12,000 from each tribe. And they are protected by God during this time. So these are Jewish people who believe in the Messiah and, and God is protecting them. And so while the rest of the world is going through all these, these plagues and everything else that, that are about to happen, this 144,000 remain untouched. They are God's witnesses on the earth, a testimony to what what power you can have if you are under God's protection. So then you get to chapter 8. Chapter 8, Jesus finally breaks the seventh seal. Now we can unroll the scroll. When he breaks the seventh seal, it says that there's silence for half an hour in heaven, and then suddenly he sees seven angels. Okay, now seven angels are lined up, and they've all got trumpets in their hands. The first angel blows his trumpet, and this is in chapter 8. First angel blows his trumpet, and it says, then comes this mixture of blood and fire coming down from heaven that lands on the earth and burns up a third of the earth. The next thing that happens is the second angel blows his trumpet and he sees this big mountain that's on fire and it lands in the ocean and it turns that ocean to blood. And so now a third of the seas are blood and have killed everything that's in it. Then the, the third angel blows his trumpet when the third angel blows his trumpet, there's a star or a meteor that comes down on the earth and it hits like the rivers and the, and the streams of water. And what, what that does is it contaminates the water and now a third of the wa earth's water supply is poisonous and people are drinking it, not realizing and dying. The fourth angel blows his trumpet and then that's when a third of the sun goes dark, a third of the moon, a third of the stars. And now all these heavenly bodies are, are turning dark. And then you get to chapter 9, right before where we're going to pick up. In chapter 9, the fifth angel blows his trumpet, and that's where it gets really, really freaky. Okay, the fifth angel blows his trumpet, and it says that he sees some sort of demonic being or angel that, uh, that opens and unlocks this place called the abyss. It's right now in the pit of the earth somewhere where God sends a messenger to open up this pit where these demonic locust-like beings come out upon the earth and they're given the power to torment mankind and they go around and they sting people 
And yet when you're stung by one, you don't die. You're just tormented for five months. And it says that the agony is so bad, you wish you were dead. You long for death, but you don't actually die. You're just tortured for five months. So now you've got all these people on the earth being tortured for five months by these demonic beings. And then the sixth angel blows his trumpet. When he blows his trumpet, it's said that at the river Euphrates, the angels release an army to go out and kill one third of mankind. Now, when this army comes through, there's still speculation as to whether it's a demonic type army or if it's a literal human army. And the reason why a lot of people lean toward a human army is because of the number that's mentioned there. It says the number of their troops was 200 million. And geographically, it would fit perfectly for the Red Chinese Army to be that army. And Time Magazine numbers that army at 200 million. Okay, so that's where people say I, I, they believe it's a human army. We're not sure if it's human or demonic. So that's the sixth trumpet. And now th that army is going to slay a third of mankind. And then we get to the seventh trumpet. And here we are in chapter 10. But in chapter 10... The seventh trumpet doesn't quite blow yet. It's just like between the sixth and seventh seals, how there was kind of a parentheses, you know, fill in the details. Here in chapter 10 is one of those parentheses. Before we get into the seventh trumpet, God gives us a different scene. Chapter 10, verse 1. Are you guys following? Does that, does that all make sense? Are you feeling a little more comfortable and familiar with the book of Revelation now? I mean, not comfortable, but, you know, just like, okay, I'm kind of getting it. No? Okay. Um, Revelation 10, verse 1, he says this. He says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. Okay. So now he says, okay, after those, those seven trumpets, you know, and the angels, he says, now I see a different angel coming down. This is a mighty angel, and some people believe that this is Jesus. It could very well be Jesus. Jesus is referred to in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. Um, this could be him. I, I believe it is, it is really just another angel who is really depicting Jesus Christ. I don't think it's Christ himself, but I think that this angel is meant to represent Jesus Christ. He's coming down from heaven. And he's robed in a cloud. Try to picture that. An angel coming down that's covered by a cloud with a rainbow above his head. What is that about? When, where do you, we first hear about rainbows? Noah's Ark, yeah. Now, what was the rainbow supposed to be a symbol of? Yeah, a promise, a promise where God says, look, I just destroyed the world by a flood, and I promise I will never destroy it by a flood again. And just to show you, to show you my covenant, my promise, here is a rainbow. Every time you see a rainbow, it should remind us of God's promise. It's, it's of his mercy that even amidst the judgment, he shows mercy and says, look, I won't do that again. See, and I really believe that that's what it symbolizes here. You know, you're in the midst of God's judgment, and this angel comes down with a rainbow showing, look, even though there's judgment going on, God is, God is, God is still a God of mercy. And it says that his face was like the sun. Whose face is like the sun? Remember John chapter 1. He says, when I saw Jesus, his face was shining like the sun in full strength. And then it goes on and it says, his legs were like fiery pillars. Remember when he talked about Jesus, how he says his feet were like bronze when it's glowing in a furnace. So this could be Jesus or it's a, it's a picture of Christ. Anyways, here in verse 2, it says, he was holding a little scroll. You know, just like Jesus had these scrolls, here this, this angel's holding a little scroll. It says, which lay open in his hand. Why is that scroll open? Because Jesus already opened and broke the seven seals. So now it's laying open in his hand. And it says, he planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So can you picture that? An angel, you know, or some sort of being, possibly Christ, holding the scroll, which represents the ownership of the earth. And he's standing with one foot in the sea, one foot in the land. I mean, that's a pretty awesome thought. Just saying, look, I own this. This is mine. I've come to reclaim the entirety of this earth. And then verse 3, it says, And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. 
And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Okay, this is peculiar. Okay, this is a total mystery to us. No one knows what the seven thunders are. But it's interesting because the language that John uses, he says, okay, after this happened, the seven thunders spoke. He says it almost as though we should know who the seven thunders are. You know, the seven thunders, oh yeah, those guys. You know, it, it, I mean, that's the, that's the language that's used here. And yet it's a total mystery because no one knows what that is. In fact, remember, you know, Jesus tells John, write down everything you say, every, everything I say, everything you hear, everything you see. And yet here, when he's about to write down what the seven thunders said, a voice from heaven says, stop, don't do it. Seal up. This is just for you to hear, just for you to see, not for anyone else to know. Okay, so don't spend a lot of time on this trying to figure it out because obviously God says it's a mystery. I want it sealed up. Some people get to a passage like this and it drives them crazy. They got to know, you know, because it's something you don't understand. But you guys, to quote Mark Twain, he said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts of the Bible I do understand that bother me. Okay, so when you get to a passage like this, you go, I don't totally get it. Isn't there enough in Revelation for you to chew on? You know, isn't there enough about Revelation that bothers you that you don't have to be bothered by something you can't know? So just take that and go, okay, it's a mystery of God. I don't know what the seventh thunder said, but look at all the stuff I do know. It goes on in verse 5. It says, Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. Okay, what happens now? The angel who's holding the scroll, probably in his left hand, he raises his right hand to heaven, and he swears. Now, this was the customary gesture of a solemn oath. It's kind of like what we do when we go to a court of law. You put your left hand on the Bible, put your right hand, and you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And here, the angel is doing the same thing, and he says he swears by what? By him who lives forever and ever. Remember last week when uh, Doug Bookman was preaching and he was talking about how when they would make an oath, they would swear by something eternal. I guess it depends on what service you went to. He gave six different messages. But, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he would say, you know, you know how you, you just swear, you know, until the stars fall from the sky or something eternal. And so they would swear by God who was, who was, who was totally eternal, you know, who, who was, who, there's, there's no comparison to him. Here this angel is swearing by him who lives forever and ever. And what does he swear? He says... There will be no more delay. He's saying, I swear to God, this is it. Here comes Jesus. This is the time for the return. And he swears there's no more delay because here we are 2,000 years later. And now some of you, maybe you were brought up being taught that, you know what? Christ could return any time. And now 20, 30 years have passed. And you begin to wonder, you go, okay, is this really going to happen? When is this going to happen? It's going to be in my lifetime. And for 2,000 years, people are saying, when is Christ really going to return? And now this angel finally says, look, you guys, I swear to God, this is the time. There's no more delay. Jesus Christ is coming. The end is in sight. And then in verse 7, it says, But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. See, he says, in that day, when the seventh angel is about to blow his trumpet, he says, this is it. This is when the mystery will be fulfilled. You see, because while we understand and God has revealed to us some of the events in the end times, you got to confess, there's a ton of mystery to it. I mean, we're all kind of going, trying to piece this thing together and going, what's it going to look like? What, how is God going to reclaim the earth? What's the earth going to be? You know, all these questions. And here it says, when that angel is about to blow his trumpet, all the questions will be answered. All the critics will be silenced. There's no more delay. You see it all. And then the next passage, the next few verses here are very peculiar. Verse 8. It says, Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel 
who was standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. What is that? <laughs> you know, what is that all about? Are you, are you picturing this? You got this mighty angel with, you know, legs of fire, face, you know, like the sun, holding the scroll, swearing by heaven and earth. And then John hears a voice from heaven saying, go take the scroll from him. So John approaches this mighty angel and says, can I have that scroll? And the angel says, yes, but you got to eat it. <laughs> okay. And John goes, okay, you know, and he takes it. Mmm, sweet. You know, and then it gets into his stomach and goes, ah, oh, sour. Okay, what is that all about? I mean, why, why is this? You got to understand, this sums up the whole book of Revelation. It really does sum up the tone of the book of Revelation. You see, there's a Hebrew idiom for, uh, for really a, a retaining or a accepting, understanding, uh, receiving knowledge called eating. When you eat, it's like you can eat food and digest it, or you can eat knowledge and digest it. Um, it's, it's, it's similar to like when I say, uh, you know, take these notes home and just chew on them for a bit and, and just digest the stuff. Okay, you don't go home, take my notes and literally chew on them, I hope. You know, you, I mean, the point is, is you let that knowledge get into your mind and then you digest it, it gets into you. And the point of it is this. Okay, this is a picture here. I believe John literally took the scroll and ate it and it was sweet in his mouth and it turned his stomach sour. The point of it is this. That scroll represents God reclaiming the earth. Now, it represents this book of Revelation. And what happens is this. When you and I study the book of Revelation, isn't there a side of it where we get so excited? You know, because all the people who have mocked us through the years, all the people who said, okay, is this Jesus really going to return? You know, that's cute. You've got your little crutch, your little Christianity to help you through life but I don't need that stuff. All those people will finally be silent. And you read this book and you go, yeah, he is going to come. And it's, and, and, and it's, it's awesome. There's, there's a rush. You just feel like this is great. Jesus Christ is going to come. And finally, everything that I've hoped for, I mean, this is why we serve him, is in hopes for this return. This is why you and I try to live according to his commands. It's because we know he sees it all and he's going to return for us one day. This is everything we hope for. And so in the book of Revelation, when we read it, there's a, there's a sense we go, this is going to be sweet when Jesus Christ returns. But then the more we think about it and when we really digest everything this book has to say and we realize, well, Jesus Christ's return is about him pouring out his wrath on those who don't believe in him. There's a side that the more you dwell on that, it makes you sick. At least I hope it makes you sick. I hope you're not one of those Christians that just reads the book of Revelations and you get Revelation, you get all fired up. And that's it. I hope you're one of those people who the more you read it and the more you soak it in, it breaks your heart. It makes you sick. In fact, that's why some people don't want to come back until I'm done with this book. Because they don't want to hear it. We'd rather just ignore it. Because it hurts so bad to think about some of these things. And, and I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, I, I love this book. And yet, there's a side of it that I absolutely hate. I mean, it, it, it turns my stomach when I sit and think about it. I'm not excited to see some of the people I care about under God's wrath. I mean, how can you be excited about that? And so what a lot of people do is they just say, well, I just won't believe that part. Oh, there's a solution. I'll just take out the parts I don't like and say I don't believe them or that's not true. See, that's, what, that's, that's our response to something that makes us sick. We'll just deny it or neglect it. And yet God wants us to take that knowledge and because it is so terrifying to us, use it to warn other people. I mean, going back to the illustration of the earthquake, it's like, well, I know it. I don't want to 
but dwelling on it makes me just go out and warn more and more people. That's what it ought to do to us, you guys. And I, I, I sometimes I, I think about church as we know it, okay? And I just wonder, do we really get it? I mean, wh- why did you show up to church today? What's this all about to you? You just, you know, it's Sunday morning, so you know, Sunday afternoon for us. But, you know, I get dressed, I go to church, and I'll go, I'll listen to the music, I'll kind of critique it. Eh, it was pretty good today, you know, I'll give it about an eight. You know, and then, you know, I'll listen to a message. Oh, it's pretty good. I like last week's more. I didn't like last week's. I like this one. You know, you just kind of compare. And uh, this message isn't too good. If I have two bad sermons in a row, I'm going to go to a different church yeah. next week. You know, I mean, that's, that's just the way people treat church. You look at the bulletin. Oh, who's preaching next week? Chuck Boma. Who in the world is that? I'm out of here. I'm not coming. You know, it's just kind of whatever, you know. And, and I'll, I just wonder, do we really get it? What's this all about? Is it just attending a service, singing some songs, hearing a message and going? Or when you hear about the book of Revelation, does it really sink in that this is truth? Does it really sink in that Jesus Christ could return tomorrow? And these end time events will actually take place. Do you really believe in your heart that there is a God who is angry with sin? And yet he has given us a way to escape his wrath. Does that really get into your mind? Because if so, shouldn't that motivate us to go out and tell other people? I mean, are you just kind of playing church? Is this just like a hobby to you? Or is it really every, everything in your life revolve around the fact that you exist on this earth to tell and to warn other people that Jesus Christ is going to return? Or is this just something you do for a hobby? You guys, John was given these words not to seal up for himself. But by this point, Jesus told him three times now, you got to go out and proclaim this stuff to other people. See, that's what verse 11 is. He closes it by saying, Then I was told, you must prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So you got to, you, you must go out and tell people about this. Because it's not just about one little group of people, it's about nations. Man, how seriously do you take this stuff? Guys, I, uh, every once in a while, I will talk to someone here at the church and be so convicted just by listening to what he's doing or she's doing. And a guy called me a, a, a while back. He was just telling me some things that were happening, going on in his life. And I was like, man, that's so cool. I was so excited about it. I go, you know what? Can I videotape you? Can I come and just interview you so I can show the rest of the church? He's like, yeah, that's fine. You know, so I, I'm about to show you a videotape just of an interview I had with one of the guys in the church. Just about some things he was doing that I thought, you know what, that's a great idea. I never thought of it. And uh, maybe it could spur some of us on to do some of these same types of things. Just thought it would be awesome if he could share... I asked him if he would just share that with the congregation through video. Um, so I'm just going to interview him and let you guys listen in. But, um, sir, when did you start going to Cornerstone? We moved to Simi Valley uh, in April of 1998. Uh, visited a few churches and um, was actually prompted to try Cornerstone by uh, Bruce and Jamie, um, who lives directly across the street from us. And we saw your, your guest packet and your, your videotape and I stepped foot in that church, and I just felt the, the presence of God in there. And after hearing just one of your sermons, I knew that was the place. I was born and raised in the church. Uh-huh. Uh, family was in church throughout the week, especially on Sundays. Um, but this church took it from me agreeing with what I was hearing uh, in Scripture, and it took it from the agreement stage to the heart, and um, actually has, has caused me to feel convicted to, to making some real changes in my life. And I'm thankful for that. Cool. Now, what's been awesome is uh, Stuart shared with me how uh, you started uh, sharing the word with people here at work. Yes. Um, but how did that start? 
It actually started about, I'd say, four or five months ago. Uh, one of the nurses we work with uh, and we're very close to died. And shortly afterwards, several of the folks, nurses, receptionists, physicians, um, were grasping at where are they in their own salvation. Um, it's something about seeing that casket lowered into the ground that just makes you think, okay, this is the end for this person. This person is probably close to my age, and it makes you look in the mirror and think, where, what happens next? And where am I in, in this whole uh, scheme of, of life? Um, there was a gal who was, who was pretty distraught and asked me some questions about life and, and about God. And, and uh, I chatted with her a little bit. She asked me if I had any, any information or materials. And so I gave her one of your sermons on tape. Um, she enjoyed it so much that she asked for another and happened to tell another one of her coworkers. Um, and that, that whole has spread to the point where now there's about 30 folks here at Kaiser who are routinely listening to your, your ministry and um, we're seeing some incredible life-changing experiences. And we're talking folks from people who at, at one point told me that they had never heard about, about God or about the gospel, had, had, had rarely set foot in a church, from, from people at that end of the spectrum to folks who were Catholics who um, had fallen away from the religion because they felt that they were embarrassed or did not want to um, confess their sins to a priest. Um, so we're talking a wide range of, of, of folks here. Cool. Yeah. So now you, um, so so currently there's like 30 people or so that come and ask you for tapes? Yes, um, yes. Okay. Yeah, actually, as I, um, I have a drawer here that I, I keep the tapes in, and um, usually this drawer can, at any point in time, can be emptied to completely full. There's about 70, 70 or 80 tapes that um, I've, I've either purchased and or been given. And I have a log here where I've, I've logged all the tapes that are available, uh, and I log them in and out to the folks who are, who are borrowing and, and listening to them. And you also told me about uh, what you did with the Easter video. Where you want yeah. To hear that. yeah. Actually, I have it here also. Um, I, I, I enjoyed myself so much at the Easter service. Uh, not only did with the, the program, but your message was was such a powerful message that I felt convicted to bring it to, to work. And, and there's so many people here who know the name of Francis Chan and Cornerstone Church and and um, have heard the, the tapes. And, and I said, you know, I want them to see the service because um, you know, some of them weren't able to make it. And so what we did is we invited um, the whole department to come to the meeting. We had a conference room and a television with a VCR and actually just played it. And, and there were folks there who were, were just, they were so delighted with what they heard. Um, we had a little bit of a discussion afterwards. I sort of reiterated some of the things, the pointers that you had were making in your in your sermon. Um, the real neat thing about that is uh, my boss, who who I know uh, believes in, in, in God and Jesus, but doesn't usually talk about it a lot. She showed up to the meeting and, uh -huh. and thanked me afterwards and told me to continue on with what we're doing here. But there were several folks who did not get a chance to, to come to the meeting because their, their physicians ran over a little bit late with patients. So yeah. they're asking me to keep the tape here and to periodically show it. Um, so I'm going to be showing it again tomorrow. Okay. And cool. um, as many times I need to show it and, and, and get the word out. I, I've faced opposition. There are folks who have said they didn't want to hear any, any of the tapes. Yeah. And there's folks who, who still uh, are opposed to listening. Yeah. But um, there are even more folks who, at the beginning, who were opposed, who were, who were listening regularly. You know, the thing I love about that whole situation is uh, Stuart is so clueless to what he's doing. I mean, he'd be the first one to tell you, I had no idea. You know, people ask me questions, and I didn't have the answer, so I just gave him a tape. You know, and the thing just snowballed, and now it's like 30 people that just regularly come for tapes weekly. A lot of these people who still don't even believe in God, but they're getting exposed to the Bible. They're hearing the Word. I mean, I, I went and I visited you know, to do that interview. And here's a, a hospital I never even been to. And walking through the halls, everyone's like, you know, I thought I was Elvis or something, you know, it's like, wow. you know, it was, it was amazing, you know, just the impact that one person could have just trying to be used somehow. In fact, uh, he explained that, you know, the morale in their wing because of people's lives being changed, just changed. I mean, just the whole climate of that work environment, so much so that the pediatric wing began to ask for tapes, you know? And, and so now they're wanting some of the sermons on tape so they can pass it around. 
uh, just amazing. And, I, and what was convicting was I thought, if I had worked there, would I have been able to accomplish the same thing? Would God have been able to do that through me? Would I have had that type of boldness and desire to just go and try something? He was telling me about it, he and his wife, how uh, one day just decided to go down into downtown L.A. and just uh, take some clothes, you know, filled up their SUV with clothes and went in downtown L.A. and just felt like we need to start caring for the homeless. And uh, on the way back, they were heading to an appointment somewhere, and, you know, they had to kind of rush and get there, and he looks over and sees that his wife doesn't have any shoes on. And he says, honey, where are your shoes? And she said, well, there was a lady who really needed socks, so I gave her my socks. I saw another gal who was asking for shoes, and we ran out, and I didn't have the heart to tell her, so I gave her mine. And the kid said, you know, I drove home that day just so ashamed of myself that I still had my shoes on. So I went and I started telling people at work, you know, I, I need some clothes, I need this and that. And the next time they went down, they had like six SUVs filled with clothes just going down in downtown L.A. Just doesn't know what he's doing, just trying to figure it out. And some of these people don't even believe in God and they're going down in downtown L.A. with him to help the homeless. You guys, it, it's amazing what you can do if you just ask God to give me opportunity, give me boldness. I, I, a guy called me a couple of weeks ago, and he says, you'll never believe this. He goes, my wife had to take the train to work on Monday. And so she takes the train to work, and as she's sitting in there, suddenly your sermon starts play, being played out loud from Sunday service. She just Someone had a tape recorder, and I guess that's a typical thing on Monday in that specific train car where someone from your church plays the sermon out loud, and everyone sits in there and listens to it. And I'm like, you're kidding me. And I don't know who it is. I don't know, I don't know who's doing that in here. You know, I haven't figured it out. No one's confessed. You know, Brian, that's, I just think, man, that is so awesome. You know, just people saying, you know what, I don't know what to do. Maybe if I blare a sermon, that'll impact someone. I don't know. But it's just the whole point of understanding that this book is so powerful. And when people hear the words of this book, it changes them. It impacts them. And yet we sometimes are so afraid to share it because we're fearful of rejection. And sure, there are people who are going to reject us. You know, talking to Stuart, he was talking about how, you know, there were people that were kind of in his face saying, like, what are you trying to brainwash people for? And yet those are the, some of the same people that are now getting tapes over the years. You know, you just never know what God is going to do through his word. And so my prayer is that God would just make us the types of people who go out and take advantage of every opportunity we get that our workplaces would be transformed by our lives. It doesn't mean we have to be a, theo be a theologian to do that. You don't have to have a ton of knowledge. God promises he's going to give you the right words to say when you need it. And so you just do the best with what you got. And I hope that that kind of illustrates for you. But, um, you know, to close this service, what I'd like us to do is I'd like us each to individually pray for ourselves. And I want you to pray for two things. One, I want you to pray for boldness. And two, I want you to pray for opportunity. So would you bow your heads right now and just pray to God and say, God, give me boldness and give me opportunity this week. so good to, to know you and to know that you love us. God, it's so humbling. It is amazing to think that you, the Almighty God, listen to us right now. You love us. And we thank you for that, God. And we love you so much for what you have done for us. And Father, at the same time, God, we, we fear your wrath not for ourselves, but for those who reject you. And so, God, I pray that that would motivate us to go and tell them about your love. Tell people that they can be fully forgiven by you and protected and loved by you. I pray that you would make us bold this week to take advantage of the opportunities you bring our way. God, you are a God who answers prayer. 
There's no way we can do this on our own. Give us wisdom. Give us tact. Give us love, humility, and gentleness when we talk to people. Help us not to sound arrogant, but just like broken people who just have fallen in love with you and have something to offer them. God, I thank you for the examples in this church of the people who do go out and make it happen and, and try to live out their faith. I pray that we would all become like that. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you guys, next week, um, Chuck Bomar is going to be preaching. And uh, if you have never heard him teach, he is such a gifted young man. I mean, he really just loves God, loves the Word. And uh, I hope you come for that. I'll be leading worship. Um, uh, we're trying to get the point across that it doesn't really matter who's leading the singing, who's teaching the message. The point is we've come to worship God and hear from his word. And, and we've got to get that in our minds. And so we'll see you next week.